G'day, good evening. I hope you're really good where you are. This is a medical cannabis show that discusses all things cannabis and it's all safe practices about cannabis too, highlighting what the do's and don'ts about what you should do and shouldn't do, I suppose. And I respect the law and I hope that you respect the law. So I won't be talking anything um, other than those types of topics. So today's topics is on roots and what roots can do for the plant or what roots can do for... Uh, the end of financial use sale is on now. That's my tablet that I got on so I can see the chat to see if there's any questions so I can keep up to date because it's a bit hard doing it by myself sometimes. <laughs> this is the stuff that's going to be going through today. So some, just what roots do really what's they good for uh etc i'll go what different um pathways they can take to absorb to by accumulate how you can safe practices and realize what's going to be in your plant what can be transposed through the plant uh because most plants well nearly all plants are bioaccumulators and uh, i'm talking about cannabis in specific so I'll be going on about some studies that have been done related to that. And the THC breathalyzer, that's pretty pretty cool, but there's a couple of studies that's on that as well. I'll show. And the phyto research, that's more so related to the, the roots and different types of ways that the plant can absorb and accumulate and process bad things and harmful products that are, that are in the substrates. There's a cool study on cadmium too. It shows the cadmium uptake and the power to hold and absorb, etc. Okay. All right, I'll get into start sharing the slides. Actually, there's a couple of funny things too. Oh, okay, I've shown everything already. So this is pretty funny, I thought. When I saw it, I thought, wow, look at that. Lego are into it too. So Lego said that they want to legalise it. <laughs> Look, even the scales are Lego. <laughs> Oregon, it's Brad. <laughs> uh, and I thought this is pretty cool. I, I just like old historic photos anyway. And this was a kind of, this is a related one. So it says in a little snippet, it wasn't just marijuana that just got prohibited. It was the truth about history. Yes. And the science why it got um made it illegal in the first place would be fantastic to know. This is pretty interesting. This is the amount of taxes that get put on in, well, this says California at the moment. Um, so it shows in comparison to alcohol, tobacco and cannabis. And you can just see the different amounts. So for a 12 ounce beer or for a, a stubby, two cents. We call them stubbies for that amount, 375 mil. Um, two cents of excise gets put on there, but for the half a gram, a dollar gets put on. And it's the same in Australia. I'm not sure about these numbers in Australia, but it's um, that's the whole reason why people can't afford medical cannabis in Australia is because there's too much tax put on. Yeah, a bit too greedy. Even, yeah, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> so true, I wish I could. Uh, I'm sure there was more to share, so I'll stop there and... There was some other stuff. I'll put on that screen in the background, add the chat. There we go. And there was something in the background. There was a bit more stuff to talk about. Oh, that's right. Snoop Dogg's thing. Before I got into it. And then it's into the root stuff. Yeah, pretty much. There'd be some times to ask questions today too, because there's not much stuff that I could go on roots. Um, Snoop Dogg. Oh, yeah. I've got to share the screen. Actually. I'll do it next time. Share screen. Now you can see everything. So here, how many blunts does Snoop Dogg smoke? Apparently, it's his full-time job. Because uh, it says here, he reckons he smokes, well, he used to smoke 81 blunts a day. So if Snoop smokes 81 blunts a day and each blunt takes eight, about six minutes to burn, that would add up to eight, just over eight hours of inhaling per day. 
So I hope it's uh, clean, weedy smoking. <laughs> that was pretty cool. So that's a fair bit. Oh, that's right. It goes down to say down here, but there's a Q and A with Snoop. I'll go through that in a sec. In the past, Snoop claimed he was smoking 81 blunts a day, but now says it's 15 to 25 a day, depending on his workload. And this is a bit of a Q and A with Snoop, and says, "What's the longest you've gone without smoking? It's 164 days. Do you roll your own?" Or do they roll for you both? Who's better at smoking weed, Dave Chappelle or Drake? Dave Chappelle. I've heard that Willie Nelson is one of the only persons who has outsmoked you. Is this true? Willie is one of the greatest to do it. Smoking music. Doesn't say yes or no. Do you believe in the taxation? Oh, there's a bit of, yeah, very good. Okay, next thing. This was the US border. They were doing some border control because they're sort of sick of the cannabinoids not being able to be detected. So they want to make a analyzer to detect it better. And it says here that the US Custom Borders is looking to buy portable cannabis analyzers to identify cannabis profiles because they don't know the difference between the CBD and the THC in people's systems or if they see the, the flower itself, it looks... Well, it's exactly the same, it looks. Um, so that's what they want to get into. And then Stanford, Stanford Uni, it's there. They've made, or they reckon, they've got a THC breathalyzer for drivers that works. That's what they reckon in this article. So they use magnetic nanotechnology that was previously used to detect cancer. So, um, yes, well, they reckon it works, so good on them. They call it a potalizer. <laughs> yes, very good. Uh, yep, I'm sharing, that's good. And now the next thing is on the, the root stuff. Phytoming, oh, this will be a good way to start. So there's different, actually there was a better way there's a better explaining things, this thing, yeah. The, this is, the early seedling root growth is largely responsive to shoot illumination and signaling processes leading to photomorphogenesis are both in roots and shoots. Developmental and nutritional trade-offs between shoots and roots are central to organ growth. Tissue-specific responses play a predominant role in light and root growth in, in relation to light root growth. Long distance signaling coordinates the seedling's response to light. Uh, this is one study that's um, called signaling events for photomorphic root development. So it really just goes on to say, am I going to go and read it all? I'll summarize it. So some of the, so photomorphogenics, so because of light, it's grown. That's what that word means. Development drastically affects the entirety of the plant's architecture. The earliest development of the plant is centered at optimizing light capture, ultimately activating photosynthesis and enabling autotrophy, meaning it can feed itself, produce its own energy. Uh, when, when seedlings are grown in darkness, it develops elongated hypercotyls, it unexpands cotyledons so they don't expand, and a closed apical hook happens, and a short and thin white root with a reduced apical meristem. That process is actually called scotomorphogenesis. But I'll go on to show some charts later on that will explain this a little bit better. That's why I was reading that in full. And photoreceptors, signaling cascade. So when the plant actually, it's probably a good time to go through this little thing. So signaling events for photomorphic root development. This is a, um, in Trends in Plant Science, done a few months ago. This is, this shows the, the genes. So once the sun comes in, photosynthesis, it activates the HY5, and that goes down and starts a cascade. And over here, that's what happens above the soil and below the soil 
the same thing happens. So if light is entered beneath the soil, it goes and starts activating the COP1 and the different processes to for the root growth. That's the easiest way to explain all that. Uh, uh, this is this is the test done from the tips tip of the root up here from the quiescent cells. Go back all the way up as the different stages of development of the cells. These are at each cell development process. That's what they go through, and then it goes right up to where it goes out of the meristem and area, and it's into its full on knows what it's doing. Um, that's just for those people who like it. This is the, the main thing is to see what processes happen in the pathways. So after photosynthesis happens, it goes down and starts producing sucrose, and then it has a direct relation to root growth. And then another one, it'll come over with a CRY38 gene, and then it'll activate here up through the CRY1, and that's where it's going to debate with the COP1, and that's where I'm with the H1. And that's, so when there's not enough light, that's what I was talking about before, that's what this is, this is usually halted and there's not enough light it'll go and, and touch it so it's hang on i've got that wrong when there's photosynthesis it comes down and activates all this and it halts this one at the moment but when photosynthesis happens it wants to go and pass it through because cop one has it activated sorry uh so in summary, this is all the different pathways you can get down to the roots. So see there's one, two, three, four, there's five here with bad ones. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven they've shown here, different pathways for root development. So you can there's all these different actions that can happen to turn on positive root growth and negative root growth. Okay, that explains that one. Actually, I'll stop sharing to get square. Say good day to some people. Hello, martial artist. Nice to see you. Good day, Ned Kelly. How's it going? Dave, nineteen sixty nine. And Australia thinks. Dave says, and Australia thinks they. Something can't understand that. Sorry, mate. Australia thinks. There, something, I'm not sure. Supreme Great, good afternoon, good morning. This is just talking about roots today and what roots do, stuff like that, their pathways, what they do, their actions. Uh, get back into it. So, so there's a few different bioaccumulations that roots can do. They're really, really good at remediating things in the soil. So one way is the phyto extraction. Excuse me. That's where it would hold it in the roots. And then you have to actually pull the whole thing out to discard it. This is why the um, cannabis is a massive bioaccumulator. So whatever you've got in your environment, it can accumulate it. And you've got a high chance in consuming it if you're going to extract it or if you, even when you burn it and inhale it, there's a high chance, there's a, there's a chance, not a high chance, but there is a chance that microbes do travel through. There was a rad study that I'll talk about in a few weeks that they did that. They found that in um, vaporizers and in your bongs and stuff like that, they harbor some pretty decent microbes that can withstand 200 degrees uh, Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius, like when you combust, when it goes right up over that number, they can withstand those temperatures and they can get into your system. But for back talking, so that's the first bit. So this is why it's really important. You should know all about where your cannabis come from to make sure it's in the soil and in the air, what's deposited on the air. So they another way that pathway that can come through is phytostabilization. So it has cadmium and other bad things, lead in the soil. So it comes up and it just stabilizes there, it holds it. So it's just stable in the soil, making it unavailable. Uh, another way is phytotransformation. So that's where the molecules are changed. So they're actually transformed into like uh, cadmium 
Oh, what's a good one? Oh, um, what's that real cool one? Has a, a redox reaction. Uh, so I don't know. Well, they change from one form to another. So um, iron from FO ferric to ferrous, as an example. Uh, Rhizo degradation. So they'll degrade things. They'll actually break them down and, and change them into other things, under the elements and other things that are degraded. They can, and same with when they degrade them, they'll take them down and then they can change them into vapour. So they'll take them for a, a liquid or a solid and then change them into a vapour and that's the phytovolatilization. This is given an example as selenium, selenium taken up and looks like CH3. Oh gosh, CH32, what's that? No, don't know. I'm not going to tell you any fibs. And why? Uh, rhizofiltration. So even in the hydroponics or in water, they have also filtering things and they're being absorbed more so. So that's where it's um, accumulating in the plant tissue itself. Very good. Uh, I should be seeing if there's any questions in chat, but I'm not. There we go. I can see now. That's today's. This is pretty cool. This is a, an experiment done with uh cadmium and cannabis to see what they found what is maintained in the soil and what levels are bad and how much it accumulates into it the full study you can go to that page there but the answers well what do they say many great up here Cannabis does take up heavy metals, but it's extremely important to understand where those metals are translocated. If the goal is to remove the heavy metals from the soil, yes, well, it's going to be in your plant. So that's what these studies are for, to see what the, how they maintain and if they're still in the plant tissue when you're going to extract it or consume it. Uh, cannabis variety, many great findings, but the big takeaway is the majority of cadmium stays in the roots. So if you're looking for soil remediation, you'll have to pull up the roots too. So yeah, so cadmium doesn't, it's a heavy metal, it doesn't really get transported through the plant too well. So that stays in the roots, that one. Oh, this is an example of healthy roots. So you can see it there, there's no real browning to it. Well, there's some browning there, but it's nice and bleached white, like as if it's been bleached, but that just shows the health of it. So that's been taken out of the pot for those who are wondering that hasn't grown like that because it wouldn't be that color if it was grown with the sun. Uh, this is some cool pathways to show the HY5 gene in the plant. HY5 is the elongated hypocotyl gene. That's the stretching gene. This was supposed to be talked about last week in the um, Genetics, when I was talking about the breeding and things, but um, I just found all the slides today, sorry. <laughs> but look, it does involve the roots. So it just shows different pathways through the HY5 where it goes down with nitrogen and ammonium reduction and how they go and synthesize and get into the roots to maintain this pathway. And it's on the other side, and also they use sulfate and iron transport through the FER gene so there's still different ways that, um, yes, micros can get, micronutrients get into the roots as well, quite well. Uh, that's a good example of, I'll have to come back to that one, of the COP1 gene and what that does. Oh, this is my, the subscriber thing. Thanks for the um, people that have subscribed. I really appreciate it. It's, um, it's good because I put a bit of effort into making these putting these shows together. Um, $80 gets you some of my privates, about a dozen or so private playlists. I've got a few there. All of my playlists have thousands of lectures of my related plant soil science and microbiology for medical cannabis. For free, you can just go and look up. And 150 gets you a 20 minute call and a novelty gift like a chart or something that I've made. 300 bucks gets a weekly call for, and that's more related to a company or for some person going through the doctors and they still just want my educated opinion. Ken Jobs, what sort of Ken Jobs is there this week? Uh, this is related to beverages. So it reckons cannabis beverages are finally taking off. 
thanks to emulsion technologies. So if, um, if you're handy with your beverages, it might be something to think about. And there is no good nutritional value in the leaves too, just like that leaf's been put in there, but it probably wouldn't turn it, actually would turn that green if it was leached out in chlorophyll. Anyway, back to it. Ah, what's this one for? This is to do with drones. So if you're into drones, you might be able to relate your drone experience and get into cannabis as well. So you get a few little attachments to the bottom of it. This is a few visual spectrometers that have been attached to it and they've gone and run a program and then it tells you this sort of information through the program. So as they fly through, it just pulls out field plots and captures different variations and changes in growth patterns and it puts out charts that can see different types of heights. Uh, that's very important. The growing degree days, that's more so on meteorology and photo periods. So it depends what sort of sensors you got in there. These must have really good sensors to give these types of outputs. The NVDI, normal differential vegetation index, shows different parameters in that. Uh, so that temporal plant height. So all cool things that could be related to people that are into their medical cannabis stuff. Without going too technically into it. Uh, oh, this is another chart. It didn't turn out with that. Sorry about that. <laughs> but it was to do with um, the phytoremediation of the plants on how they accumulate and what they do, how they transform them, what they do inside of it, how they pass them into their cells and through their apoplasts and symplasts around their cells. Yes. Uh, so any questions or any cheers? Purple thumb. How are you going, purple thumb? Nice to see you, mate. Matthew Flick. Hope you're doing great as well. This is a, a today's talk on roots, and there will be a bit of a Q&A at the end because um, I probably haven't got much more to go. Uh, what's this one related to? This is roots architecture on how they can go and manipulate it through CASPA, uh, CRISPR, Cas9 editing. So I'll go and what's this? Root phenone non-disruptive, hydroponics, gel-based, aeroponics, rhizotonics, rhizoslides, or paper-based ways that you can go and manipulate it. Now you put cellular traits, I'm going to manipulate it through that. That's the pathways. So they'll go and they'll find it first, what they want to manipulate, and then they'll map it, what they want to try and do with it, and then they'll try and put it through the editing machine and see if they can come out with their result. That's what that slide shows. Uh, Uh, soil contamination with arsenic and cadmium and sulfuric or sulfur. Okay, this is showing the that the cells in the plants can also bioaccumulate it and hold them. So as it comes in through the cell wall here, it will come in through the, the vacuole. It's got a pH of uh, five we're out normally in the cytosol it's seven so it comes in there and it changes and can hold and that's where it stores its bad stuff so this is inside of one cell inside of a plant so if you were to go and bust open the cells in it inside of the cell you're going to have trace elements of arsenic and cadmium that have been stored there that's what this pathway is showing oh that's it there's more than that there's got to be more mate Stanford. Oh, that's that one. Oh, yeah, and we can talk about some the effects of roots on from different uh, experiments. <clears throat> so, photoreceptors signaling cascades. So, beside, so that's the photoreceptors. So, lights effects on roots. So, besides fueling photosynthesis, lights effects on plants development are largely dependent on the activity of cellular photoreceptors. Regardless of their per perception mechanism, light triggers conformational changes in photoreceptor protein leading to downstream signaling events. The signaling outputs downstream the photoreceptor activation, they converge to suppress the ability of certain genes like the COP1, which is the constitutive 
photomorphogenic gene. Cool. And another effect is from the roots responses to illumination. So shoots only in illumination, they promote root growth and suggest that shoot to root signaling occurs in photosynthesis dependence. Direct root illumination is usually perceived as stress signals by the roots. Direct blue light exposes leads to bursts of reactive oxygen species. You know, that's all the bad um, carcinogenic type of problematic minerals, the elements that we don't want to be developed because that kills everything. So if there's too much reactive oxygen, the oxygen's in there and the oxygen's going to attack things and break stuff down. And that's what gives us cancer and causes the plants to have problems. So going on. So also direct blue light also affects root morph, morph um, as growth. <clears throat> and it also triggers negative phototropism. Phototrop negative photo well, phototropism is how it reacts from light. So negatively means that it goes or bends away from the light. Furthermore, root illumination represses the root elongation through the phytochromes. So cryptochrome is blue and phytochromes is red signals. So through the red signals, it also represses root growth. And blue, yes, uh, and it goes and say what blue light does. Oh, well. Metabolic demand and photomorphogenesis. The growth of the hypocotyl and the primary root compete for sucrose as an energy source. So who's going to get it? Me or you, up or down? So sucrose contains the root's primary metabolism and also functions as a major shoot to root signal, regulating nutrient uptake to counterbalance the shoot's photosynthetic carbon uptake. Right, that's getting a bit technical. The light effect on the root. Can you summarize? Uh, I'll try and summarize it. Con oh, good. Concluding. The past decade has extremely exciting for plant photobiology and remarkable discoveries have been made on shoot photomorphogenic responses and underlying photoreceptors. By contrast, the signaling events controlling root photomorphogenesis have been largely overlooked and are now surfacing. Recent findings have shown that long distance communication plays a role in photomorphogenesis, abiotic stresses and biotic stresses, nutrient signaling and other factors. <clears throat> so it's good to look after the, the other pathways so the roots can be looked after because people, you know, you can't really see the roots too much. So it's um, something that's, you know, forgotten about. People just look at the leaves and they just think, oh, cool, it's just the leaves there. Um, well, yeah, there are some other factors going on. Hydroponic folk would probably more so be into their roots because they'd be lifting up the lid to check them all the time, make sure they're nice and white, not getting an infection. And decaying with the, the so this is a cool the roles of the HY5 gene in plant growth and development. So for those that are like they're into their genes because I like the gene numbers because the cannabis plant has 30 32,000 odd genes. So if we can know what those genes are, know their pathways, and we can manipulate them. Like before, remember I showed you the root pathway where there was. Um, I'm still I'm still sharing. Good. No where there was, uh, yes, this one, where there was 11, 11 pathways down here to root growth. So if you can manipulate any one of these by doing some easy ones, like this one on the outside, which has two, one pathway step, so it's just got sucrose once it goes through photosynthesis, the sucrose there activates this pathway. So if you can manipulate this pathway as an example, you have a chance of doing things and helping the plant through problem growth and development stages. Oh, I'm going to close that off. Where was I up to? Uh, HY5 genes. So from light signaling, these are the different genes that are engaged. And I'm not going to name them all. This is not at all. This is more as a reference chart. And then it'll say what the genes do. So the HY5 is the elongated hypocotyl 5. And then it'll say it's mode of regulation. What it does, does it induce or does it repress? And then it's binding sequence. That's for the, yeah, it's DNA code on how it binds. Um, that's getting, I'm not getting technical like that. I'm not even close to it. 
So the light, that's just explains this chart and then there's references at the end to how these got up if, you've, uh, if you're really interested. Uh, so there's the gene numbers. I love all the genes. And mostly too, if you really want to know the genes, you think, how can you ever remember these? Well, they're named after what they do. So the, um, well, the COP1, COP that's the constitutive photomorphogenic. So COP, constitutive, and then photomorphogenic. Uh, the elongated hypocotyl, we have to know elongated, but the hypocotyl, the HY5. I like the ELF because I've gone and mucked around with the ELF gene quite a lot. It's the early flowering gene. Uh, I've got the ELF3 I play around with a lot, and I can test that easily through uh, morphogenic expression that I've gone and talked extensively about last week in the breeding one. That was a two-hour show, that one. It was so exciting. I could have talked for heaps longer because it's, it's exactly manipulating these. How do I transfer this gene? How do I make my girls finish at day 50 and die instead of day 65 and dying where there's no more anther or pistil development? So by manipulating this gene and getting this transferred successfully, that's how you can do it. Oh, this is an easy one. Circadian clock associated. So see, CCA, circadian clock. So, I'm not, so that's just an example on how, what the genes are for them. So you can nearly guess on in, if the, in the pathways that they're trying to, uh, that you're trying to work out. So this shows signaling process and all these genes for light signaling, circadian clock, this anthocyanin biosynthesis. I've made a very good video on how to turn and turn off anthocyanins in your cannabis plants, and it works every time. It's, I tested that over a number of years before I put that video out. Uh, more so on this chart, it goes to show genes on chlorophyll biosynthesis, cell elongation, and hormone signaling through oxen and ethylene. So it's so, it's brilliant. I love all these, fascinating all these genes, how they can turn off. Oh, and then it goes down to the next page. It's got other, oh, the other hormones, brassinosteroids, and cystic acid, nutrient signaling, Sucrose terpene synthesis through the QH6 gene. <laughs> Defense signaling through the, yeah, and ROS signaling, and that's it. So it goes, sees all the different processes, all the different genes that are involved with the HY5 gene in plant growth and, and development. So it's extremely, it's great if you want to get into it, and I do. So there's, I think there's some other cool, yeah, look at all this chart down here. So if you go through the sunlight and then it represses your COP1 gene, that means some of these won't be turned on, which is good. But you want sunlight to action and to produce the cell elongations. That's why these just flow on. When sunlight happens, it turns on as the example this one, which will turn on this one, which will happen and produce the action. There's something cool to talk about this. I think there was a summary down here. <sighs> Regulation of the HY5. Yeah, it is. It's really cool. You can really get, regulate it. See through these hormones up here? You can manipulate it. So cytokinins, halts it, strigolactones as well, gibralic acid and ethylene activate it. It's very cool. Um, Emerging responses mediated by the HY5, so the circadian clock. So photoreceptors have been shown to directly regulate the transcriptional and several clock genes, demonstrating that light is important factor that drives the rhythmic behavior of the clocks. Uh, actually, this is the this is a chart to show the anthocyanin biosynthesis. Figure three, pigment accumulation, no molecular. Here we go. So shade avoidance. So phytochromes. They're the red and cryptochromes are the blue pigments in the spectrum as many downstream components involved in shade avoidance responses that have been thoroughly discussed in recent reviews. Recently, this HY5 has shown to be required for hypocotyl and petiole, the leaf stems elongation underneath the shade. Terpene biosynthesis. So light is known to regulate plant terpenoid metabolic pathways. And it goes on to get technical, uh, uh, just saying which genes interact. So this is just a showing. I just want, I'm not going to get into it. Actually, I should see if there's any questions. 
Uh, Matthew Flick Laney, good morning, good evening. Purple, drop a link, drop a like for all the work Aussie puts into. Oh, good on your purple thumb. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Supreme great. Thank you. Can you help us get into her jeans? Purple thumb says, <laughs> with a G. <laughs> yeah, nice joke. That's appropriate. <laughs> good on you, mate. Supreme great. See ya. He's out. See you, Supreme great. I drop a thumb every time, says Laney. Thank you. Oh, Laney. Yeah. Um, so what else does the HY5 gene responsible for? So if you can manipulate it, the opposite of it is the DWF gene, while I'm just talking about the dwarfing gene. So this is the um, hyper um, elongation of hypercolum. The DWF gene shrinks it. So another way expression of the HY5 is cold temperature positively regulates the expression of the HY5. That'll do. At both levels. Yeah, both sides of the RNA. Uh, what else does it do? So HY5, plant cell death is triggered at the end of cell life, but also when plants are exposed to biotic or abiotic stresses. In fact, red light positively regulates reactive oxygen species accumulation and cell death during seedling deethylation, so when it's in the dark, and response mediated by the HY5. HY5 also activates dis defense, dis defense responses in red light, directly promoting the expression of the enhanced disease susceptibility gene, the EDS1 key activator. Interestingly, HY5 also binds to the promoters of the worky genes that encode for transcription factors involved in defense responses. I'm working with the, I just activated my worky WRKY29 gene, and that is related with systemic acquired resistance, SAR, if you Google both those, it will come up. And it's to do with activating the pathways that will defend against or activate immune systems to defend against fungal. So I've got fungal resistance in my genetics. I've tasted it a fair bit. So it's not fungal proof, it's just resistance. So if that immune system gets down, the working gene works fine. But if my immune system in the plants are down and they're not in a good favorable condition, in other words, if the plant's stressed or not feeling the best, or it's going to be, its immune's going to be compromised. So this working gene may not work as well. So it's only really in really good health. You got to keep your, your girls to get the defense response. Uh, and that suggests that the HY5 could play a role in mediating light dependent defense reactions as well. In the light, the nutrient assimilation, so light is known to regulate several nutrient signaling pathways associated with increasing demand of metabolic processes to create energy, such as a lot of things. I'm not going to read them all. So I just want to skim over things and not be too technical. Uh, so this comes down and reacts with your nitrate and your ammonia. No, it's, they're not the right ones. Nit nitrate response. Uh, HY5 is conserved in plants. No, all right, I think I'm over that one. Conclusion, yep, it's all finished. Another study done. Uh, so in addition to, in, I'll read, because this is it. Get your questions ready. If you've got any questions, please. <laughs> um, in addition to the role of the HY5 in photomorphogenesis, the recent research findings discussed in the re latest review suggest that HY5 function goes beyond the photomorphogenesis and seedling growth. It's also devolved with, involved with stress. Furthermore, it goes to interact with several hormone pathways as well. So you can go and manipulate them through uh, through hormones. So those people that are using PGRs and they think that they have to use only PGRs to limit the height of the plant because it, it halts their one of these pathways to stop the ELOS cell elongation. Um, you can manipulate it through hormones as well as through light. So please don't use PGRs in your growth medium. Although HY, it's very, mate, PGRs are dangerous as it's carcinogenic. I know you don't care, but it's just carcinogenic. So please, can you somewhat try and change? Uh, 
although this connection just goes on about the cytokine and so it just goes on about hormone and nutritional pathways so yeah very good i think that's it stop sharing just see if there's anything going on back here uh liney gotta give a shit that's the first now i'm lining eh? oh okay no oh, lin a lin e i there you go <laughs> sorry i hope that's better right oh well i'm um just about it not much i can Anybody got any suggestions on what they would like any questions answered or anything like that? Because I think today might be short. I haven't had a short show in a while. The last few have been going for multiple hours. It's been all right, though, because the topics have been pretty interesting. Speaking of topics, what's next week's topic? Let's have a look. Lives. So I'm starting to get some... Yeah, I'll show you. Uh, where are we? Back to here. Plant present. Share screen. I'm starting to go back through the LinkedIn stuff. So I'm getting all of my, a lot of new up-to-date studies on different types of things. And I can share all those now. So that's really cool. Uh, I enjoy doing those because can only sort of talk about so many things, you know, so many, this plant can only do so much. Uh, so this week was all the roots and THC breathalyzers and phyto research. Next week, plant tissue culture, even though I don't have much on that, I might skip that for a few weeks until I can get more stuff on that because I've got a lot that's piling up with the fungi and microbial consumption and the risks involved with that. Mate, oh, should I just briefly talk about that? Momenix is in the room. Hey, Momenix. You wouldn't believe this study. Actually, all right. Momenix, come in here. I'll share this. Here's a brief a sneak peek. Oh, I was sharing. Shit. Okay. Sneak peek. Microbial risks to cannabis consumers. Did you know that microbes carry through their smoking devices? They've tested, they've got a cigarette up here with a HEPA filter, and then they've got a cartridge at the bottom to collect the liquid out of it. Then they put it through a batch, a sequence machine, and then they find that there's still existing Pseudomonas, Cryptococcus, Rhizopris, and Aspirillus species that are still there. So even though it's gone through a HEPA filter, it's still, there's still microbes involved fungal toxins, so the toxins that are involved and they can be released. So once those are in there, they mightn't be alive, but they might have an endotoxin that are built inside of them. So once those toxins are released, that can also have its cascading effects. And it gets in and causes problems. So there, there's a bit of a brief a sneak peek in just the latest sort of stuff that's been, I'm trying to focus on and to try and, yeah, Go a different route. I don't know which route else to go because it's fun. I like looking at those new things. So hopefully we can we can get some sort of discussion up about those. Hey, Momenix. Oh, what's Lainey say? I've had less than three hours sleep. No suggestions on my end. Sorry. Oh, well, thanks for trying. Uh, so that's what's happening soon. I'll be discussing those fungal and microbial consumption charts. And then there's another chart, which will be on the week after, and that's to do with terpenes increasing, enhancing the THC's effect. So there was an amazing study done on how they work together. They synergistically to enhance the THC's effect. So there's some cool graphs and stuff to go through and see which terpenes actually do it well and which terpenes aren't as good. And yeah, and then, yeah, that'll do. Uh, right, eh? well, I appreciate everybody for tuning in on this Roots special. Actually, what, uh, let me make sure, I've got a Roots, um, let me talk a bit about more Roots, just to include it. Yeah, I can actually, I'll, I'll get, I've got plant science, there's a section there where I've got Roots. 
Jono Who Cares has rocked up. Hello, Jono Who Cares. Hope you've put aside that um, that hella fight for me, Jono Who Cares. Uh, what was I going to show? Oh, roots in plant science. Rhizosphere. Oh, there's not many. Oh, there's a few little experiments that have been that have happened here. I can see. I'll share them with you guys. Why not? Share screen. Uh, Rosesphere. Yeah. So you can tell if a root system has had sufficient, as you can tell if your cultivar has had excess or it's um, toxic or excess or it's deficient in nitrogen. And the way that you do that, you would look at their different, their primary roots. So you're going to see what type of root system it has. And this is more so done from a uh, seedling because if you've done it from a cutting, you're probably going to get adventitious roots, which go out like that. Not really have this big main central tap root with the lateral roots coming to the side. So in normal good nitrogen, you'd like it to be here with sufficient nitrogen. And it's just got a nice big long tap root and then it's got its lateral roots coming up the side. So it might be a tap root, it might be a primary root. So I'll just call it primary. And then when it's starting to get a little bit less of nitrogen, it's starting to look more. So it's putting more lateral roots out. And then when it's really in survival, you'll see it, it's just really struggling. It's half the size it should be with virtually little or no lateral root growth. And if you go on the opposite end, when it's too high, you'll see that it's got a big primary tap root and there was no lateral root hairs going out of it, like as if there's been a cytokine um, response. That's with nitrate and ammonium. So the two plants are nitrogen elements that it requires is there. What else do I have to share with you? Uh, not sure what this is depicting. It's a very healthy looking little one though. I uh, don't know what that's depicting, sorry. Day one. Oh, this was a an induction of Arthrospiroplatensis. So it's a spirulina, which is a nitrogen fixing uh, bacteria. It's bacteria, yeah. Yeah, it's not an algae, it's a bacteria, cyanobacteria. And that puts out a high amount of tryptophan. And tryptophan is a precursor to oxen. And spirulina is 75% tryptophan. So I thought, well, why not just um, let it do its thing here? and see if I can get an increased oxen growth, oxen um, proliferation. So it's pretty cool. Uh, what's this one? This one is, I think this is, Showing the top bit, there's no deficiencies. I reckon that's a inoculation of spirulina. That was an experiment to seeing would spirulina help with rooting as a rooting medium, and it didn't really work that well. That's why I didn't go on with it. Uh, and this is a nice picture of a nice healthy root ball. If you hold it up, you can see it was growing in a square container sitting underneath, and you can see all these. We're putting this is where the hydroponics went into the tubes, so it was pulled up and lifted out of that. So they were just going along that. It was about you can see the depth of it, it was about this deep and how it was sitting in. <laughs> nice, healthy root system. It's what you want. See how they're all very, very white bleached. There's no type of brown. So for a, a hydroponic grower, that's exactly what they want. If you've got browning on the tips, you've got to ask the question why is there fungal growth or bacteria growth starting to proliferate down there? Oh, there's a nice little cutting. It was cloned in the peak pucks. I thought, wow, that looks all right. Look at all its little buttress roots nearly that are sitting, sitting above the soil. 
There you go. That's my little root section. That's done. Jono, who cares? Do you have any questions, mate? You still gotta email me, Jono, who cares? Please do. Because otherwise, we're gonna probably, I'm gonna wrap it up soon. Because 50 minutes, it's been going for. And without going through other things and probably just talking for the sake of talking, I don't really have anything interesting to share. And the questions aren't really flowing, so I'm not quite sure how to uh, handle that bit. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's how I should have it at the start. If someone wants to remind me, get rid of me. <laughs> oh, there's, okay, this is a screen underneath it, underneath the options bit. Matthew Flix says something here. He's, Matthew, I enjoy watching your video or viral logs. They are so interesting to watch. Have have good one, everyone. Oh, thanks, Matthew, for the um, nice words. And Jono says he doesn't have any blimmin' questions. Well, that's no good. Ah, he does say what's he, he lost his room to seed. That's okay. You can make a little seed um, section. You don't need a big area to seed because seeds don't take up many size, much size. So you can do it in a little hutch. You can do it in a little cupboard. You can uh, do it in little tiny things, those little greenhouse things that you get, like a shelving system. And even just buy a, you're in Thailand, so a bookshelf with panda film or plastic around it to keep it uh, sterile-ish would be good with a fan inside and a nice fluor, couple of fluoro lights. And there you go, you got your little seedling room, mate. Uh, where was that? Actually, where was that? That was tissue culture, wasn't it? Yeah, okay. All right. Anything else, John? or any other questions? Doesn't look like it's going good. I'll give it a bit of a... Uh, lost room to seed. Yes, okay, says John. Very good. All right. Um, well, I can't really. What else can I wait for? More questions that mightn't come in? What should I do? <laughs> it's so awkward. Uh, well, I hope that everybody knows about their roots and how important they are on how they should be maintained in their rhizosphere. So watching all of the bioaccumulants that can get into them, watching all of the different pathways that can be accessed from all the stresses that go on around them. Uh, so I hope that that was uh, those slides that I showed earlier, integrate that. And I'm gonna have to call it. So thanks everybody. I'll be here next week again, doing the same thing. Not sure if it'll be tissue culture or fungal yet. Uh, if you've got a preference, please go to my community section on my YouTube and leave your requ re requests. Uh, there's a little community section there. And my playlist on YouTube, they've got thousands of hours of my university uh, slides related to plant soil science and microbiology. So you can even go into them and just go put in something into the search engine and under my playlist and it'll come up if you're having a problem or a deficiency or some sort of bug problem or something of the like. Jono asks, when you're when doing your seeds, should you have it wet or dry? When doing your seeds, should you have it wet or dry? Um, well, the seed needs three things to germinate. It needs air, water, and temperature. So I put a seed, if I put a seed, I'll sit it on top of the surface. So I get a cup of water and throw a few seeds or put a few seeds in the cup first then tip half fill it full of water and washing the seeds off and washing the seeds around. So the water's gotten a nice clean um, pericarp or the tester on the outside. And then they'll sit on the top of water and don't bump the, the jug, don't bump the little container the cup because otherwise they'll sink after a few days 
and it's 10,000 times slower for the plant to get oxygen out of the water than it is out of the air. So that's what, what I try and leave them sit on top of the water because people have put them in paper towel, the paper towel dries out. So you'll find, which I've done in the past, it'll, if things will be going great, then after a few days you'll forget or there might be a hot period or something of the like and then it'll be too dry and then bang, it's shriveled and killed. So I maintain this where it sits in half a cup of water, I never get dramas. And then after a few days, maybe four or five days, if it hasn't germinated, that means it's got it's dormant. So you've got to do some dormancy breaking techniques. And that's another stalk talk <coughs> itself. So I hope that helps with your germination. Uh, roots when brown. Yeah, you don't want brown roots, mate. That means you've got some sort of fungal, more so a fungal arm infection. It could be bacterial, but 90% chance it'll be fungal. That's bad. Cut them out if you've got a big, massive roots and then ask yourself why and how did you get them? Because you have to stop them getting that like the next time. JC Smith 71, peace. How's it going, mate? All the way from Canada, he says. I used to live in Canada. Welcome. I live five years up in Canada on the West Coast in BC and Yukon. Very nice place. Doing all my cannabis research. Fantastic. Cheers, he says. So if today's talk, JC Smith was on roots. So if you've got anything related to any questions related to that, or actually any other questions is fine on cannabis because um, I'm finishing up to, for today. Uh, you're welcome. And next week I'll be talking about other cannabis related topics. And it's either on fungus or tissue culture. I'm not quite sure yet. If I can get some more tissue culture slides in the next few days, I might do tissue culture or I'll just probably just do fungus and how fungal and microbial interactions in cannabis and especially how the ones, that new study with the inhalation. So I'll probably actually just because of that, because of safety reasons, I will, I'll do it next week. So it's fungus next week. I'll be talking about that with all of the, how microbes can pass through your vaporizers and through your HEPA filters and what they do and they sit in your bong water too. And it's plus two, did you know that the, if you buy it from the regulatory testing bodies, they only test more so for two fungal species. And uh, you're saying, what are they? They are penicillin and aspergillus. Those two they only test for. So out of many other thousands that there are, they only test for those. So for people to say they've got clean weed, it's probably clean of those two if it's been tested under those parameters. Otherwise, it's got other spores and stuff related to it. So when you go and burst them or consume them, you're going to bust those spores and whatever mycotoxins they have inside from their bioaccumulation or their processing pathways, it, um, you'll absorb them. It's Oh, no, I was amazed to think that that the cigarette passes the bacteria, some bacteria pass through the HEPA filters in that cigarette experiment. That was um, that was pretty amazing. That's it's it's pretty scary, and it does explain why a lot of people do have wheezing and, and thick chests. <sighs> you know that heavy tarry stuff on your um, on your lungs. So it's. That's why it sits into your, heavily into your bronchioles and your bronchioles real deep and it just sits there and breathes and it's hard to get out. I used to have bronchitis, so I know a little bit about that and that's why I use my volcano now because of that reason. People used to say, God, you got emphysema and I didn't smoke cigarettes. It was because I smoked pounds of weed every year. Uh, I've smoked two, and a half, two to two and a half pounds of weed for the last 30 years, so I'm nearly 50. So um, I had to change my techniques in my early 20s to kin to maintain that status. <laughs> uh, Joe, thanks. You're welcome, mate. I'd like to help. So thanks for the props. JC says, interesting. It is interesting, yeah. The amount of microbes that can pass through HEPA filters, that's what we all th thought it was. 2.5 uh, micron screening. It's fine. Well, no. These scientists in the latest studies has um, done that. I've yeah, I love listening to the microbe stuff. There was a talk just the other night that was um, suggesting similar things too. It's just the diff the science is evolving so well, they can test better parameters and test for finer things. And they're finding um, 
yeah, science can nearly be rewritten in a lot of areas. I love it. So, yeah, a lot of the information I say is to current to this date, not to current in the future because science can always change. And I'm open to science and being challenged on topics because it's um, science. That's what I go with. Science, woohoo! Look, just hit the hour mark. Thanks for those last couple of people who helped get us over the get to the hour. That was good. It's going to be a shower. So I hope next week, JC, you can join us from Canada and tell you tell your mates. What part of Canada are you in, JC? Actually, see if you're close to a few regions where I've lived. It was awesome. Good on you, Dave. Thanks for the props, mate. You'll have to be rewarded soon, Dave, I reckon. You've been here just doing non-stop. Keep up good work. Yes, I appreciate those people who are just not into drama, who are into plant science. Australia's got a horrible community. Sorry, that, but um, yeah. <laughs> Some aren't horrible. Like, I don't know, I'm, whatever. It's just plant science, mate, not drama. Good on you, Liney. Thank you. Have a good one, everybody, she says. JC, ah, over in the middle, in the prairie land. So it's big and flat. That's cool. No worries. Very good, mate. Yes, well said, Dave. That's okay. Enjoy the education and forget the drama. Well said. Exactly, Blumen. Well, that's what my thoughts are because humans... We don't really get on. We're all nearly inbred, for starters. So if you look at the, G the DNA code, it's, it's horrible. So we're all going to clash with each, with each other. So it's um, bound to happen. So people just can't get over it. It's unreal. So, yeah, I'm, I'm down. JC says, born on the East Coast. Oh, yeah, that's the way. Over in the – I've never been over that way. What's that? Nova Scotia. Yes. That's cool. Or that's close to where the, um, the polar bears are. I haven't seen any polar bears. I used to like playing with the brown bears and a couple of black bears. It was fun. And John agrees too. Yes, it's all about education and forget the drama. What a waste of time. <laughs> if anybody, if you've got any suggestions for any topics that you're challenged on or anything like that, any myths, I'm open for more help. Um, to help to enlighten the topic. I don't know it all. By far, I'm so, I'm a student on this. But from what I do know, I like to share. And I've studied it for 30 years. And I've studied in university now for quite a few years. And that's how I can share. So, Because um, there's so many ways to grow and so many ways to go through the eight different growth phases in medical cannabis and to get different outcomes. It depends what you want for your medicinal purposes to how you can really manipulate the end result. It's really cool. NS, Nova Scotia, that's Trailer Park Boys. Woo! <laughs> They're cool. Down there in Moncton. They're cool, those fellas. Nice cartoon series. It's, Jesus, rad that, isn't it? If you ever want to laugh, look up that, the cartoon series of um, those fellas. You'll get a few good laughs, I tell you. I've watched all of their stuff. Jono says, uh, Okay. He says the laws have changed. Well, that's a good, I hope it's a good thing. We all want to stick to the law. He says uh, the laws have changed here in Thailand. Jono can not do any labour but can consult. Yes, no worries, mate. Good on you. You're always doing the consulting. You're always, um, you know your stuff. I'm always here to handle questions if you get any tough questions because you know the basics, mate. You know how to get a good result. That's for sure. I've known you for a while. Right oh. Cool. Liney says, cool. There's family over there. Yeah, thanks, bro. No worries, mate. Well, just yep. That's the truth. It's very good. Well, next week then I can distinctively say because of the safety reasons that we're going to be discussing fungi so fungi and microbial consumption risks 
So I'm going to go through a few rad studies of what fungi does of the total yeast and mold count study. And it shows the different things that have been tested for and parameters for that. Uh, I'll go through some critical factors in minimizing fungal contamination. There's a few cool things that you can do just to reduce it. Uh, there's another cool studies on the contamination risks of doing it. If you want to see what's growing in your crop, you'll get a Petri dish, for instance. You'll go and put it in where your canopy is and you'll see, turn the fans off and you'll see what lands on your Petri dish and then put the lid on it after 24 hours and then you'll start and see what colours change. And you can know from that, all right, cool, it's uh, yellow, it's aspergillus or it's uh, white, it's penicillin. Uh, as an example. So it's it's really cool ways you can do your own testing, not just leaving all this stuff up to the labs. That's the type of way that I like to talk is not like the three ways for marker-assisted breeding. You can do morphogenic visuals or you can do molecular or you can do the, what's the third one, staining. So you can either do one with stains, one that's in the lab with the machines or, and then the third one's your morphogenic. So I like to really discuss the morphogenic ones because that's what everybody can do. So it's no point in sort of spinning only what labs can do because what's the point in that? I just like, um, yeah. So then everybody can do their own experiments and tests on their own cultivars and get all their own results because everything's so different. It's Every cultivar is different with all these different lines. It's rad. Even there was a rad test of the, the length of the hours. Did you know if you can get chunky buds from growing, um, the experiment was 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 hours in a photo period for, to see the end result in these buds on a few cultivars that were grown. And it was turns out at 10 hours, it's really chunky. So if I was ever stressed with my electricity, as an example, I wouldn't be doing a 12-12 cycle in flower. I'd be doing a 10-14, so 10 on, 14 off, as an example. So there's cool things that come out of these studies. Woo <laughs> All right, it's enough of me talking. Thumbs up, thanks. JC Smith, thanks, Liney. Jono, everybody, thank you. Appreciate everybody rocking up in the questions and stuff like that. It's um, It helps, interactions. And for those subscribers too. Uh-oh, cool. Is this for next week? I will do a culture and ask questions. Yeah, you can do a culture. Yeah. Um, yep, do a culture and see what questions. And But remember, you have to sterilise the dish first. So if you're going to do a Petri dish um, to see what types of microbes you pull out of your canopy, you'll get your Petri dishes. You'll go and get some ISO. You'll sterilise them lots. And then you'll put it in a corner where there's not a real great deal of fans and or really next to buds or right in the plant where there's not a great deal of wind action. So you can see what's deposited on, onto it. And then make sure that you don't want, as a human or anybody else, doesn't walk around those areas where you're trying to collect your specimens. And then you'll get a good indication of what's actually in your canopy at that present time, what type of microbes are there. And then after you get them, after 24 hours, you put the lid on it straight away and then put it in temperature, which is about the same as the room. So you'll go and nearly just leave it in the room, up in the up in same conditions and see what grows in it. And that's going to be, see the problem is doing it that way. You haven't got a medium in the bottom of it. So you can maybe just add water, but that means water. You'd have to put sterilized water into it first. And that means there's no bugs in it. So those spores that you got would land in water and they would start and proliferate that way. So that's the way probably that I'd suggest doing it because you're not putting any minerals or vitamins or any types of other things that's required for cell growth or cell multiplication. So yeah, if you can try and do it that way, you can do water in a microwave. What you're gonna to do to sterilize it, you get a cup of water, put the lid on it, uh, or the lid, you know, briefly on it, so it'll bounce around and just leave it in the microwave with water in it, half full, and put it on for a few minutes. You wanna be bubbling, I think, for three minutes. So it's got to get to its uh, boiling point for three minutes, and that means it's gonna kill all of the bacteria and stuff in there and the fungi. And then you can use, is it three minutes or four and a half? It's a duration anyway. Or if you've got a kettle, put the kettle on <laughs> and use kettle water. 
but sometimes that's not as clean too because animal elements and stuff as it comes out of the kettle it's um things weren't they've got extremophiles and those extremophiles can handle um volcanoes and lava and all types of conditions like that it's very like geysers and things that are really um hot areas so it's hard to that's why in tissue culture it's all about cleanliness it's all about disinfection so if you can somehow pull that off Jono and onto your petri dish you'll um see what colors are growing and that'll just give you an indication so yeah sorry about that long haul so throw the cup of water in the microwave reverse osmosis water in the microwave bubble it for four minutes then it's pretty sterile and then you can tip a smidgen of that into the bottom of a petri dish that's also sterile from your iso and then put that into your canopy and then see what spores and microbes fall on that and then you'll um yeah put the lid back on 24 hours later and see what colors grow and then i'll tell you uh, next week what colors what colors refer to what species um what genuses of the fungus and then you can have some indication of yeah what you're working with all right that'll do I will, Jono says, I will try and get some proper cult cultural dishes. Little plastic Petri dishes even. They're little plastic jobs just with a lid on it that sits on top. It overhangs it a bit. I suppose you can even nearly do Tupperware containers, mate, if you'd say if you buy and things, because I know what it's like in backyard Thailand. Thailand, you know, anything like that. It mightn't work as well, but it might be, yeah, give it a go. I know it's like living remote. It can be hard sometimes. It's easy for people to say, just get this, just get that. No, nah, it can be hard. That's what I meant. Oh, yeah, cool. Chinese dishes, they're also really good they're from takeaway Chinese foods. You don't use Chinese ones because they've got oils and fats in them and they're hard to get rid of them. But that's an example of the condition, the containers that you can use. You don't need all these glass fancy things or to buy their $15 each tissue culture things um, but, uh, all right i've gone on extended time now well, i hope everybody's enjoyed it i've enjoyed it so thank you everybody for rocking up you've made it for an interesting and interactive show i appreciate that a lot and for those people that have shared their wallets as well uh, i appreciate that too those subscribers thank you again so thanks everybody and next week fungal we're going to talk about fungal practices so it's a safe use. So fungi and microbial consumption risks and studies. I'll put that, I'll post that soon on my YouTube so you can see it. I'll do it next, I'll do it soon. So um, yeah, it's up there. Everybody can see it and get ready for it. Like my Manix, hopefully. Woohoo! Hey, my Manix. My Manic meds, yes. And Liony too. Cheers, she says. Peace out. Yes. Cheers, everybody. Appreciate everybody. Thanks again. Happy breeding, happy growing, and good health to you all. Bye bye. <laughs> there you go. I like the community. So I'll, I'll share the little community that's the friendly community that I try and promote. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Bye bye. Thanks, Dave. There you go, mate.